Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, August 8th, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Slides aren't changing for some reason. All right. Let's try that again. <laughs> Here we go. Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, August 3rd, 2017. This is the week in charts. How's that? Still not working? My slides won't change. What am I doing wrong? Went so well in rehearsal. Well, I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> Let me restart. Uh, what you call it? PowerPoint. I guess you could sing a little bit. <laughs> Here we go. Weird. It's just not working. There we go. Sorry about that. And thanks for hanging in there. All right. I want to thank you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions. Any questions you may have on trading? If you don't mind while we're in the slides, keep them to while what's in the slides, but feel free to ask about anything. And then when we get to, when I open it up for individual stock picks, hold off until I get to the charts, just so I don't overlook anything you may have uh, be asking about. And then just put in one symbol at a time and hit return. You can ask about as many as you want, but just one at a time. And that's for your benefit. So what are we talk about? Well, I want to revisit IPOs. There's some interesting developments here, or I should say continued observations and continued developments happening. And I want to spend a little time to flesh that out and if you go back to i guess it was in june i did what was probably a little bit more comprehensive um webinar where i covered the ipos in a little more detail but i do want to kind of rehash that so uh, if you go to my youtube channel after you get done watching this and do a search for ipos you'll get quite a few webinars that i've done on ipos but anyway, some really cool developments here. So we want to hop right into that. Uh, and then Dow 22K. Yay, I'm going to tell all my friends. Everybody's all excited about that, especially the media is going ape stuff. And uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal, but we'll talk about it. It's certainly a good thing. Anybody remember the Dow 10K hats? Those idiots would come out like, <laughs> right? Dow would be like 9999. They come out, and then every now and then somebody would accidentally throw one and get all excited. Anyway, it was fun to watch on TV. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's talk about IPOs. Now, Will Rogers once said, buy stocks that go up, but they don't go up, don't buy them. Now, he was being a little tongue in cheek when he said that. But there's quite a bit of truth to it when it comes to IPOs. And one observation, among many obviously, but one observation I've made is that the new high is often set within the first week of trading. And many times the first day could set the tone and the new lows could also be set in the first week. So what that looks like is usually the, the high 
set during the first week of trading, that's five trading days, or the low could be quite significant. And my first rule is the earliest I'll ever get into an IPO is day five. And the pattern I'll show you today will get you long on day six. And the reason I use these little sardines is the story of the sardine where, I don't know you guys have heard it a thousand times, you can Google it. But basically there was a bubble in sardines and they were trading sardines and all of a sudden sardine tens became very, very expensive. And one guy decided instead of selling his on to the so-called greater fool, he decided he was going to eat it and he opens up his sardines and they were rotten. And so he tracked down the guy that sold to him and he says, oh, you silly fool. They're for trading, not eating. So IPOs are for trading, not eating. They're for trading, not holding on to them forever. Unless, of course, they move in your favor. And one example, and if you go back and uh, I have a link later on, I'll, I'll, I'll give you. But if you go and read the Snapchat article I wrote when I was speaking in Traders, at Traders Expo, I think it was in, in February, I showed an example of an IPO, and one guy raised his hand and goes, well, didn't that IPO later crash? And I'm like, absolutely. But we were stopped out at a profit, and it just makes a case for their trading vehicles, just like everything else we do. And you have to have a chair for when the music stops. So anyway, that's why I use the sardine. So let me just show you the phenomena that often occurs. And one thing that I say, if they're priced too high, they're going to die. If the underwriters do a, a bad job of pricing the, the IPO too high, they're not leaving any meat on the bone. Now, without digressing too far, ideally the underwriter wants to price it high enough to where the company gets gets its worth, but leave a little meat on the bone for the investors to get off the hook. And that's kind of a short answer of pricing an IPO. But as I said a second ago, if they're priced too high, they're going to die. And you can see in this particular case, the first day of trading turned out to be the absolute high. And here's another case of a fairly recent IPO. And you can see the first day of trading, again, turned out to be the absolute high. And this is why, even if you can, you don't want to buy them back here should you be fortunate. I lose that I use that term kind of loosely enough to be offered the shares. Now here's a case where day two set the high. And you can see that the stock kind of took off a little bit, looked like it was off to the races. But within the second day of trading, it had already had found its high, and then it began to sell off. Here's a recent example, cars.com. You can see on day four, the high was set, and so far we haven't seen that high. And then, of course, the Snapchat debacle, which sort of rekindled my discussions on IPOs. And this is where the little system that I'll show you in just one second came from, or setup, whatever you want to call it. But basically, I wanted to prove that you could use a very simple little setup and it would keep you out of trouble in IPOs. And a lot of my research stems from that. And I'll give you an example that I talked about last time I did a week in charts where we focus on IPOs. But back in 90, oh gosh, I'm dating myself, 95 or 96, I wrote an article for Stocks and Commodities magazine and then that whole research came from the fact that I set out to design an incredibly simple system for trading currencies and all I was looking for was a breakout from the moving average and then if you if you want that article it used they used to charge you a dollar ninety five but I think so many people have copied it it's it's I wouldn't say it's in public domain but it's out there in the internet it's a 220 EMA breakout system by yours truly but you can see with snapchat day two turned out to be the all-time high there was a little bit of euphoria follow through a little follow through on day two but that was it now i would never confuse the issue with facts 
But from day one, I had no idea how the hell I'm going to monetize a stock that focuses on a company, I should say, that focuses on putting googly eyes and puking rainbows on people and sending them to your friends. But maybe they have a business plan. I don't know. Now, I'm not a person, as I said a second ago, to confuse the issue with facts. If this stock was headed higher, then I'd be all over it. I don't care. Okay. And you have to reach a point where you don't care. You don't really care what the stock does other than what sector they're in. You just care if they go up or they go down. Now, we might be having deja vu all over again with another highly anticipated new issue. And this is, in case you haven't guessed it, this is Blue Apron, A-P-R-N, right here. So let's take a look at this one. What happened on day one? Well, your all-time high was set. So I think I made the case without – and I could, I could show you countless examples of this, but I think I made the case on why – you don't want to buy them before they come public and why you don't want to buy them as soon as they come public. Give them at least a week before you even think about it. Now, again, the genesis of the what I'm getting ready to show you was just a simple little system to keep you out of trouble. And I had no idea Snapchat was going to implode when I wrote the article. So here's a simple system that will keep you out of trouble in IPOs. Now, I had to put the word often in there because there are some cases where you could get into trouble trading anything, okay? There's always a potential for a loss. Now, this is the this is the original article that I wrote, daylander.com and properly trade initial. But instead of typing all that in, just type in Snapchat in the search button on my website and that article will come up. So here's the system, Dave Landry's Daylight IPO trading system. Got to start putting my name on stuff. My wife's been bitching at me about that. Take a page out of John Bollinger's book. <laughs> the first rule is a low must be above the five day moving average. There's daylight. So you can't, there won't, they won't be a five day moving average until day six. So day six is the earliest that you could ever get in to an IPO with this pattern. So I needed some kind of rule other than just saying wait five days. So I think the five-day moving average solves that. And the stock must close at a new high with the caveat that if day one sets the new high for the first week of trading, it must also close above that high. And I'll flesh that out in just one second. So this is what it looks like. And if you go in and see that, read that article when you get a chance, You'll see that this is an example. I just scraped it straight from the article. But notice that it makes a new closing high here. Now, the all-time high was actually set here. But we're going to go off of closing highs. And I learned many years ago that a closing high is very important. They could be kind of stealthy. Sometimes a market will make a closing high that's kind of masked within its prior highs. And they could be very important. And psychologically, if you think about it, when a market closes at a new high, new closing high, anyone who's long the stock is happy and making money, except for anyone who's slightly above that close. And you got to realize that if somebody's a bit of a longer term investor, they're not going to worry so much about the intraday prices and they're just going to check that closing price. So psychologically, it's important. Now, you do go long. I guess I should have left that in there. I should have added that rule too. But once this occurs, this is a market on close system. M O C or buy on close. However you want to look at that. But you're going to buy on the close. Now, obviously, there are cases where it might not be obvious until after the close whether it's going to close a new high. But in a case like this, it was pretty obvious that it was going to be a new closing high. So you'll know a few minutes before the close. Now, one thing that I have another pattern that buys on the close, and one thing that I suggested is if you can't buy on the close, then look to trade the next open. The only problem with doing the next open is, one, if it gets away from you, do you still chase it? And number two, if the stock opens lower the next day, then it's got you thinking, well, maybe I should hold off. So it could introduce more decisions into the equation. So ideally... 
you want to buy on clothes. And then I've personally had some issues uh, just not being around for some reason or, or, or more usually I'm around, but maybe distracted or whatever and forget to get in. So the next day I am looking to get on an open. But in an ideal world, this and the buy it B pattern, you want to be buying on the close. So here's another case where you can see that the new high was actually set on day one. Now the range was pretty narrow in this one, FYI. And this is one thing as I was getting ready to go live this morning, I was thinking about is I am a discretionary trader. And there are a lot of little rules that I have that might not be blatant, such as I'm not going to rush out and trade an IPO that has a really tight range like that. I want the stock to prove that it can move around a little bit and there's some interest into it. But the good news is by the time it got around to setting up, it began to develop a, a decent range. So you would actually go long on the close of the first day that it broke above the five-day moving average and closed at a new high. And then in addition, it also took out the first day of trading high too because the high was set on the first day of trading. Now, here's an actual open trade with a pattern I call buy at B. But on the following day, it did set up as Dave Landry's IPO daylight breakout system or whatever we're calling this thing. So that would be day one, obviously. That's day two. That's day three. That's day four. And this is day five. And you can see day five also turned out to be our new closing high. By the way, as I often say, when it comes to IPOs, they either fly or they die. Okay. In this case, it looks like a fly. Hopefully, I know I just said hope, but hopefully it'll continue to fly. But you can see that we've got the five-day closing high here. So if we trace that out, let me back that out. So here's your five-day closing high. So if we trace that out, we know it has to close above this level here. And also, it has to have its low or it's low, I should say, has to be above the five-day moving average. Now, when all that occurs, you buy on the close. Now, I'm a pullback trader, but with IPOs, they have a little bit different characteristic. When they're making new highs, you got to remember that everybody's happy. And I know it's hard buying in the new highs, but sometimes that can be the thing to do. Now, one thing I've observed with this is it does have some interesting longer term promise. So let's say a stock like Ferrari comes out and notice on day one, it makes its all time high and it sells off fairly hard. So here we are a year later, way over here, a year and change later, and it still hadn't made a new high, but eventually it does. And then it begins to take off from that. Okay, it's hard to see, but this is actually a little gap above the moving average. If you want to call it a moving average gap, that's another way of calling it. I think the Chinese call it a window or whatever, or Japanese, I should say. In Japanese candle speak, they call it a window. And I don't know if that's a new development or not, but it's a gap above the moving average is what we're looking for. But even though that this is no longer an IPO after a year and change of trading, it still has promise, and if you think about it, anyone who's still holding on to this from day one is now happy. So that selling has likely exhausted itself, possibly way back here even. Okay, We don't know. It's a big question mark. But what we do know, and remember, everything from at least my way of looking at technical analysis, I'm not using any arcane type of technical analysis. I'm not counting a wave or using some sort of numerology or something like that. I'm just using common sense and psychology. And using common sense and psychology, I know that anyone who still owns this stock is happy, is making money. And by the way, not to digress too far, I know. Haha, <laughs> with me, right? But people often sell stocks on the way down 
and not on the way up. Just people just finally give up and throw in the towel. I think greed kind of sets in maybe on the way up. But that's another conversation. But anyway, everybody's happy when it makes new highs. So one thing I find interesting is that even though IPOs often die like this and just come public and implode, eventually they get their act together and then can rally again. Now, Phoenix type of what I call a Phoenix and an IPO patterns can work very well. Like an I, let's say an IPO comes public and just bombs like this one did. Okay, let's say it comes public up here and just bombs and bombs and bombs. But sometimes they'll just get there. They're just slowly based. And eventually, a lot of this pent up supply, maybe even the pre-market supply, gets washed out of the system. And then you look for a bow tie or something to head higher. Race took about 14 months. Facebook also took about 14 months. I think Larry Connors had a strategy called Trading Winners that also uses gaps above or below simple moving averages. Ah, really? I wonder where you learned that. <laughs> no, I learned so much from Larry. I probably give him, I don't give him as much credit as I should. Uh, I try to give him credit as much as possible. But, yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. You said Facebook took 14 months. We can look at that one, too. So the point is, don't buy them right out the gate. Have some sort of plan. Um, I do like bow ties and first thrusts type of transitional patterns after they bottom out. And then it's just, I find it really interesting that there's still an edge from my empirical research on buying them when they make new highs, even if that new high takes a while. Like Howard said, 14 months for Facebook, which we'll pull up in a little while. All right, so um, since I'm talking so much about IPOs, I thought it'd be a good idea to put the complete course on sale and just use the promo code IPO200, no spaces, all lowercase, and then hit apply, and you'll save $200 on the IPO course. And that's good until Monday. When's that? Fourth, fifth, uh, I think that's like the eighth or something. Let me double check that. Monday is the seventh. So that's good until Monday, 08, 07, 17. All right. Any questions about IPOs before we hop into Dow 22,000? I know we have a lot of regulars here, so you've seen these patterns before. All right. Dow 22,000. Whip out your Dow 22K hats. Should we be celebrating? Well, the media sure is. And certain politicians are taking credit for it, which is always a bad idea. <laughs> but I guess you got to spend, spend it the way you want. Now, it's nothing to sneeze at. Don't get me wrong. It's certainly a good thing. But keep in mind, obviously, it's only 30 stocks. And they're price, price weighted. So the higher the price, the more weighting it's going to get in the Dow. And what I'm going to do here in just a minute is I want to take a look at some of these components. We can take a look at all of them. And dig a little deeper and see what's happening. But right now, Boeing is really helping out the Dow. And then, obviously, Apple, still up here, pretty high levels, is helping the Dow out, as is Goldman Sachs and the 3Ms. And Home Depot, which is actually set up as a short, I'll show you in just one second, is helping out, too. In fact, let's just hop right in to that. Uh, before we do that... Um, I guess I got to stop saying it's here because it's been here for a while, but Trading Full Circle course is now available. And you can go right here and start watching the videos. Watch the first four videos for free. They're pretty good if I say so myself, even though it's super duper basic, the first videos, the base videos. There's a lot of good things in there 
again, if I say so myself, just on how markets actually work and to avoid the BS that's out there. Uh, that course is part of the learning management system. The IPO course is not yet into the learning management system, but it might be the next course that I put into the learning management system. And the learning management system just means that it's well organized and it has quizzes and you have to go through the entire course. Many times with my courses, because they're so comprehensive, people will email me a bunch of questions and I'm like, go back and rewatch this. And they're like, I didn't watch it. It's like, well, go back and rewatch it. Here's your answer, but go back and rewatch it. So now I know whether you watched it or not. I'm not going to be big brother. Don't worry about that. But I'll know whether you watched it or not. And if you pass the quizzes, et cetera. So it's going to force you to go through it. All right. Any questions on anything? Obviously, you can email me if you're watching a recording of this. If you're here live, you can ask them live. How do the indices look against the advanced decline lines? Well, I'm not – I don't use – that advanced decline lines that often and reason I say that often is occasionally I'll be in a webinar as you guys know I, I, I'm often the host of the timing research uh, expert panel and somebody will bring up some sort of uh, advanced decline indicator or something like that and I'll go to stockcharts.com and check it out but for the most part the research that I'm doing is empirical and we'll take a look at that. In fact, we'll just jump into that right now. So I'm not that excited about using advanced declines, but I'm using them by simply looking at a boatload of charts. So let me get that up. Let's take a look at the Dow 30, and then I'll pop into the uh, – I'll show you what I mean by the empirical research. Empirical. That's a that's a fancy word for saying looking at looking at stuff. It's like people who use autumn instead of fall. All right, let's take a look at the component list of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And you could see, I guess we could sort them by price. So Boeing is obviously way up here. Now, I'm a trend guy, don't get me wrong, and I'm glad it's way up here, but this move looks pretty parabolic to me. And it could easily have a massive correction from these levels, and that would certainly put some weight on the overall market. Goldman Sachs looks like it has topped out in here, and this is why it's always good to dig a little bit below the surface. 3M is broken down. You've got a big gap down here. It's going to probably have a hard time filling that gap and also taking out this overhead supply. I mean, if anything, it looks like a short. I used to call that, or still call that, explosion gap pivot. It's also, it's going to be what's what I call a forced bow tie. And a forced bow tie occurs when you have a sharp move down. But it's a bow tie nonetheless, and you can see so far it's just retraced up a little bit. So it's still set up as a short. UNH looks pretty good. Nice longer-term uptrend there. So far, begging on new highs. Now, Apple made this massive gap higher. Gaps in general are a good thing in the direction of the trend, but sometimes when you have a big gap like this, it's hard for it to sustain itself. And a lot of times you have a big gap and it'll come right back in. So that's a little concerning. McDonald's has kind of grinded its way higher longer term. So that's okay. But Home Depot, you can see it looks like it's in trouble. Let me clean the chart up a little bit. It sold off fairly hard. And so far it's just retraced back up to resistance. So that looks like a short to me. IBM is obviously in a downtrend. The two Johnsons is just kind of chopping around in here. So I just want to kind of look at the hot ones at higher levels because these ones at higher levels are going to put the most pressure on the overall market. You see Travelers banging up against its old highs. Not too much to get excited about that, but at least it's right around its old highs. And then finally, UTX is set up as a possible short. 
In fact, it's a pretty good looking short. It's HV is pretty low here at nine. So you got a couple of stocks that are a little frothy in here, and a couple of stocks that are looking dubious, or quite a few stocks that are looking dubious. So I wouldn't get too excited. Number one, it's only 30 stocks, and number two, you've got some some stocks that are looking questionable. Now I hope all these stocks that are looking questionable, dubious, overbought, etc., will just go higher. But you have to dig a little deeper and see what's actually going on within the market. Now, speaking of which, as Howard pointed out about advanced decline lines, let's take a look at the NDCs first, and then let's drill down a little bit and see what's happening. S&P off a little bit today, but as you can see, stuck in this little bit of a sideways range. Chop, 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 chop. It's kind of settled into a typical sort of midsummer pattern over the last couple weeks. So far, its breakout remains intact. So far, the big blue arrow remains intact, but getting a little choppy in here. NASDAQ composite, also a little choppy in here. So far, holding above 6,300-ish, which is obviously its prior range, top of its prior range, and so far, its breakout remains intact. I wouldn't say it's the end of the world if it dropped below 6,300, but I would certainly be concerned and it certainly is a good thing as long or it's it's better for it to stay above it now let's put a 50-day moving average in here for s and g's and usually or quite often i should say instead quite often technicals will come together at the same point so support 6300 and you can see that moving average is going to be there pretty quickly too so as long as you stay above the 50 i wouldn't get too excited 6300 50-day moving average pick your poison but if we drop below it, I would become a little bit concerned. Now, speaking of concern, the Rusty is a bit of a bummer. It tried to break out. It's been stuck at a sideways range. And this is a little bit more indicative of what's going on internally. It's pretty mixed out there. And one of my litmus tests for health of a market is just looking at a lot of stocks and looking at the number of setups I have. If I have so many setups to where I have to spend 20 minutes trying to figure out which setup I want to take, then I know the health of the market is pretty good. The market is trending, and I should be trading. If I could barely find a setup to save my life, and I can't get excited about it, then I know it's a market I probably don't want to be trading. So... That's a really good litmus test. My Landry list is really small, and I haven't recommended a stock in a few weeks. But that's okay. I wish somebody would have told me 20-something years ago that you don't have to trade like a madman every day. Yes, let your positions work that are working. Just have a stop just in case. And keep looking for new setups and do your homework and spend all that time doing your homework. But just know that a lot of times there won't be anything to do. And I forget who said it. I'm trying to think. Ken Lambert, maybe, or um, Brian Gelber, one of those guys. And I, I'd love to give him proper credit. But we'll, I'll, it's, it's in my slides for Trading Full Circle. But we spend a lot of time doing research on things that we never do, paraphrasing him. And that's, that's a story of my life. I spend hours and hours and hours looking at charts and often don't find any opportunities from it. But that's okay. When you reach a point where you could walk away and be okay, I think it's when you finally begin to get it and know that you don't have to work. I'm sorry, you have to work every day, but you don't have to trade every day. Anyway, Russell, a bit of a disappointment, down about a percent yesterday, back into this stupid sideways range. I sure would like to see it get out of this range and not look back for a while. Now, the, center, the sector action, he tried to say, is somewhat mixed. You can see that, in general, energies have been improving as of late. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about the energies because they're coming off of these mid-levels. I'm more excited, like way back here, we were along some energy stocks that look pretty good. I like them when they're coming off of major, major lows, and ideally all-time lows. And I also like markets, obviously, when they're making brand new highs. But when they're kind of in this mid-range here like this, 
mid-range shorter term, mid-range longer term, I'm not as excited about them. Same thing going on with metals and mining, although metals and mining are a little closer to making multi-year highs, and so I might be a little bit more excited about them when that happens. So if you're newer to my methodology, I occasionally will trade transitional patterns off of lows like back here. I think we got long CNX or something like that way back here, and we wrote it for about a year. And there might have been a couple of other ones. But I get very excited doing major transitions off of major lows or major highs. And then I also like well-established trends. When things are just kind of in the middle of a range like this, big, wide, and loose range, I'm not as excited about them. Now, one thing that is kind of good within the metals is certain areas have been improving as of late, such as steel and aluminum. And they are beginning to make new highs. So if they do begin to make new highs in earnest, then maybe we'll find something worthwhile going after. Gold just doesn't look that great in here. I'm not a huge fan of drawing trend lines unless you're drawing them through the bars, as I often preach to judge for persistency. But occasionally I will connect the dots. And you can see so far it just doesn't look that hot in here. You can see falling tops. So it's not or falling peaks, whatever you want to call it. Doesn't look so hot. Now, banks have broken out recently, and they're kind of hanging in there, so that's certainly a good thing. Insurance is doing fairly well, too. As you can see, banging out brand new highs in here. Drugs, bit of a disappointment. So it's like the more you look, the more mixed action you see. Now, I look at all 235 of these sectors every day, the Morningstar industry groups. And that gives me a pretty good feel of what's going on. In addition to that, and I'll show you briefly, I also look at my entire tradable universe. But you can see that drug stalled out at prior peak, so that scores a bit of a bummer. Now they're at multi-week lows at the time I am broadcasting here. Biotech looks a little bit better, but it's come back in too, so that's a little concerning. We had a nice breakout, nice pullback, nice thrust, but then it really didn't take out this prior high very much. And you know me, I prefer markets to be accelerating versus, versus decelerating. So in other words, let's see if I can get this thing to work. I like to see markets head higher and then accelerate, kind of like a parabola looking, as opposed to head higher and then decelerate, okay? Yes, this market's still higher than it was, but notice that it's losing some steam. So momentum is very important if you are going to be a trend guy. So it's kind of mixed throughout. You can see health services just recently made brand new highs, but now it's pulled back in. And then now, and this is something that I beat the dead horse on, but now the net-net change going back several months, it's only 3% to May, and then it's only a percent and a half going back to June. Well, one bad afternoon, and it would be flat. And then if you go to just play with these lines a little bit, and you can see it's less than 1%. And then if you obviously go to the middle of June to where we are now, it's actually down. So always look at where the market is on a closing basis and look at where it was on a closing basis. Go back to that Russell 2000. It's going sideways for well over a year. So that's a little bit concerning. Now, some areas have improved greatly, such as retail. I wouldn't rush out and buy them. There's one or two stocks that have caught my eye in retail lately, but I just can't get that excited about it. I want to look at the overall chart and see that it still looks like it's in trouble. Brand new highs earlier this year imploded and now retracing back. So I'm not, again, excited about a trend transition here, but I would reconsider them if they started banging out new highs, and that would be a trend resumption type of pattern. Transports are looking pretty dubious in here. They pulled all the way back to the prior breakout, so that's concerning. And most of that damage is from the major airlines. So the major airlines are not looking so hot in here, as you can see. Software just recently banged out new highs. Kind of looks like the NASDAQ itself, so it looks okay, although it's gotten a little wide and loose and choppy over the past week or so. Semi scores as a bummer. 
I'm a big fan of, I'm not as worried about the transports as I am something like the semis. I like the semis to confirm what's going on in the major indices. And you can see the semis have banged out new highs not that long ago, about a week or so ago, but now they've since pulled back. So I sure would like to see them make some new highs. So the point I'm trying to make is it's mixed out there. Now let me just show you real quick. If we went to, let me show you my tradable universe, which is simply the stocks which have a 50 day, I'm sorry, a 30 day moving average of volume greater than 250K. I'm not using, I don't use volume as an indicator. And I know some people want would like to argue with me over that. And I think I can make a good case for not using volume, although I have experimented with volume by price, which is uh, a stock chart. So you can get to the stock charts. It gives you the volume on the side of the chart based on the price. And that shows you where all the trading happened. But usually if you just eyeball a chart, you'll see where the trading happened, obviously. So if we sort these by the 50-day HV. Now, the stocks that are way up in this list, over 100, they're going to be mostly too volatile trade. So let's just pop and look at some stocks that are less than 100 in HV. And you can see this stock's headed lower. This stock's headed lower. Looks like it could be in trouble. This is almost a short here. Okay, that's just kind of a sideways choppy stock. Sideways. This stock could be in trouble. So you can see that when you dig internally, I mean, this one looks like it's headed higher and pulled back. Sideways sideways to lower sideways recently stalling out so when i go through all these charts and most of them are sideways and choppy and i'm having a hard time finding something to trade then i know i probably should sit on my hands and this is one that came up recently and was on my landry list and i say like, well i just can't get that excited about it and then today it's imploding not that i Occasionally, I miss stinkers, but the reason I couldn't get excited was you had all this overhead supply here. Now, I'm kind of backed into something I want to talk about today, too, is that we have had a lot of debacle de jure, and this is uh, Exhibit A. It's down 25% today. So... As you can see, there's a few in uptrends in here, but a lot of stocks are in downtrends. A lot of stocks are becoming more than just a pullback. This is restoration hardware. This is a biotech stock. You can see pullback recently looked pretty good. Now it's beginning to implode a little. Another stock imploding, stock in a downtrend, sideways, 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 downtrend. Pulling back, but looking kind of dubious. All over the place. Well, this is an ETN. It doesn't, it doesn't count. Another ETN. Sideways, down, sideways, sideways. So you look at a couple thousand stocks every night, and you get a good feel for what's going on. Downtrend with a big gap right here, obviously. So this is my advanced decline work by looking at a lot of stocks. So I'm having a hard time getting excited about the market. I don't want to fight the overall tape because we're not too far from all-time highs. But when I go through my charts and see a lot of debacle de jures, a lot of sideways stocks, a lot of choppy stocks, and a lot of stocks and downtrends, plus I can't hardly find a setup to save my life, then I know that maybe I should just sit on my hands and let things shake out. I don't want to be a raging bear but it might be a good time to just let things shake out. SPWR yesterday, I noticed, got whacked pretty hard. It was a pretty good-looking stock. It started to shape up. Made it to my momentum list, and then it got whacked. So you could learn, you could observe a lot by watching, I think is what Yogi said. Here's a case where you got a stock that's headed higher. Here's a couple headed higher. But as you can see, for the most part, looking kind of dubious in here. Another one of these debacle de jures, MTSI, you can see, imploded yesterday. Um, I have a list of them here somewhere that recently imploded in my notebook. Nuva, I think, was one. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, DDJ, uh, let's see. Uh, Nuva, N-U-V-A, Wix, W-I-X, E-L-L-I, W-D-C, and FLS are, are some recent debacle de jures, in, in addition to the ones I just showed you. 
So this is my empirical research, which is a fancy way of saying looking at a bunch of charts. And I'd highly recommend you do that, and that's a very good exercise. All right, let's open it up for individual stock questions. And then um, Howard said, was talking about Facebook, so let's take a look at that going back in time. So Facebook, way back here, let's zoom the chart in and go way back in time. If you guys want to start asking, and girls want to start asking about individual issues, feel free to do so now. We'll pull them up. While we're waiting on that, let's take a look at what Howard was saying in the Facebook. Steve says, clear and concise. Thanks. All right. You're welcome, Steve. We'll take a look at that. He wants to look at FS, FCX, which, if memory serves, is a – that's going to be – is that free pork back moron or it sounds like a metal stock? Hurry up, Facebook. When did this thing go public? Okay, 2013. Okay, so you know, another testament for not for not buying the open on a stock, even if you can get it like Facebook. And I knew someone who actually got it pre-market and was all excited. Here's the deal. If you're going to get IPOs, you have to you have to take whatever crap they get you, give you. But you can see opening gap reversal on day one, and then it began to implode. And Howard said it took, what, 14 months before it finally got its act together. So it doesn't mean that you, you don't want to consider them down the road. But I would much rather get in on something like um, maybe like a bow tie or something. You can see you got a little bow tie back here. And then even all-time highs, which would be up around, what, 43, would be a place that you might consider getting in on an IPO. But, yes, you can see that. Sometimes it takes them a long time to get their act together. There you go. So there is a longer term, appears to be a longer term edge in buying new, P new IPOs when they hit new highs, or buying IPOs when they hit new highs. But it wasn't, it wasn't a route higher, you can see, but it did work its way higher in kind of a choppy fashion. Now, keep in mind that Facebook was a big, thick stock, and it did chop around a lot. But, yeah, good observation on that. So took it about 14 months before it finally got going in here. All right, Steve's waiting patiently. Yeah, this is our free, pack, free port MacMoron. Now, here's a case where I hear you. It's a nice little transition, but it's a mid-level transition. I like transitional patterns coming off of all-time lows or major, major lows. And by major, like five or ten-year lows or at least two or three-year lows. But I hear you. It's worked its way higher. It's accelerated, and it's pulled back. Okay? It's, remember earlier we talked about acceleration. It's got that working for it. But I would pass on this one. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about the metals. Now, maybe if the metals begin to bang out some new highs in here, I might reconsider. Donald, let's talk about NGE. The you're probably going to to those of you who've never been to a show, you're probably going to see me not like a lot of stocks today. I'm not Mikey. I don't hate everything. It's just there's not a lot of stocks that are set up. If you come to a show when the market's in a persistent trend and it's pulled back, you're going to think, boy, this guy never met a setup he didn't like. So Donald's teasing me. What about the situation in Nigeria? Google Nigeria, or do a search, not Google, do a search on Nigeria on my website. I think I have that anecdote in there. Uh, yeah, it's banging on new highs. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of trading ETFs, uh, but I hear you. It's got some bad memories back here. Some guy would, was calling me, begging me to go to Nigeria. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> No, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say no. 
DDS or DDS Dillard's. I like Dillard's. I'm not a huge fan of buying retail now, but this one did make my list land last night. And I don't see myself rushing out and buying it, but I'm certainly paying attention. And I hear you. I can't argue with it. It, it made new lows and then it accelerated higher. I'd like to see maybe a little bit more knockout move to it. Um, it's a little wide and loose longer term, but it's recently got its act together. It looks okay. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about retail right now. I'm having a hard time getting excited about stocks in general right now, simply because, again, I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups that I like. Donald, I can't talk about that one. It's on the Landry list today, but good eye on that one. RDFN. Mr. John. Yeah, this one caught my eye yesterday. It needs to be on your IPO watch list. One, two, three, four, five. It's actually priced too high for the buy at D rule. But starting tomorrow on the close, it could set up as the Dave Landry's IPO breakout pattern. So, yeah, that needs to be on your watch list. Got good volume. It has good volume, I should say. CO also for John. Yeah, this is one I've been watching. It's on my momentum list. It's a little thin or can trade a little thinly. That's okay, I guess. It's traded thinly today. Uh, it's in a massive trend. It, with a stock like this, based on the massive trend, I've been looking to get in, but it just really hasn't offered me a chance to get in. Um, I would wait for like a TKO move or something, but this is definitely on my uh, on my watch list. So good eye on that one, John. John, that one's on my uh, Landry list for today. Not that I want to go out and buy it, but good eye on that one. Can't talk about it. Sorry about that. EXEL, you guys, stock picking is getting better and better. You know, I keep saying in all these webinars uh, or like courses, like if you don't believe me about people asking about stocks that are going nowhere, come to the weekend charts. But all of a sudden, everybody's getting better and better. So I might have to change that up a little. Uh, my only problem with this one is it really didn't get past its prior highs in here. It wasn't that solid of a breakout. And then now it's already pulling back. Uh, ideally, I like to see a stock break out, not look back, and then pull back. But you can see that it really hadn't made that much change in quite a while. I mean, it's 15%. I guess there's nothing to sneeze at. But I think I would pass on this. You would think like something in biotechnology can make a more impressive run. IPI, yeah, IPI, that's a uh, Phil stock, right? I was looking at that yesterday. Um, Phil did a little bottom fishing on this one. Can't argue with that. It's a Phoenix pattern, and it's breaking out to new highs. So, yeah, on a pullback, I mean, you got some bad memories at 14, but you know what? If I got in at 4 bucks and it went to 14, I'd be pretty damn happy. But, yeah, on a, on a pullback, absolutely. And what, what have I been talking about a lot today? Acceleration and trend. You can see so far it's beginning to accelerate higher, which that's what Donald's saying. Good point. We have a lot of Donalds and Dons here today, COST. Uh, you want to short it, or what do you want to do with this? You certainly want to buy that, do you? Uh, yeah, if you want to short it, it looks like a pretty good short to me. It looks It's wide and loose, so I would pass. But, yeah, if you're in the mood to short, it's kind of got a witch hat look to it. You see you got this V-shaped recovery here, but now it's stalling out at the prior peak. Okay. So, yeah, if you want to short it, short it. Are you long? And if you are, shame on you. Oh, I shouldn't shame you, huh? Shame, shame. <laughs> That's what makes the market. I guess somebody's got to disagree. Somebody, we need some trend fighters out there. You know, I guess we can't bring everybody over to the dark side. Um, yeah, Phil, I hear you. It's a little wide and loose longer term. But it has gotten its act together as of late. And what's what's the what's the theme of today? Acceleration. It's got the acceleration to it. So maybe after a knockout move. You will have some resistance to deal with, but 
maybe after a knockout move, and certainly in a nice little uh, run higher. Speaking of run, HW wants to talk about RUN. All right, let's zoom in a little bit on this one. The first thing that I see is the net net problem. It's not horrible, but you could see that it really hasn't moved much, about 2% in a month and change. And, you know, what's the theme of today? Acceleration. So it's kind of going, it kind of took off and now it's kind of almost drifting in here. Not that it can't go higher. I've seen a lot of stocks take off after doing that, after a bit of a consolidation. But based on my methodology, for me to get excited about it, you could see even longer term, you could see it's lost momentum in here, okay? It would have to break out decisively to new highs and then pull back. So maybe to like eight and a half or so and then pull back it might be worthwhile. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with putting something like that on your momentum list. B, D, S, I. <laughs> feels very happy about his uh, IPI, as he should be. Yeah, this is kind of interesting in that, now it does have some bad memories back here, but before I pick that apart, let's take a look at what's happened with this stock. Um, it doesn't have much daily range, though, does it? What's going on there? A little, it looks a little funky. It might be, it might be a, a bad spread or something. But so far, it's kind of broken back, broken out. It's pulled back. I'd almost like to see a tiny bit more pullback in it. And then you're going to have a lot of bad memories along the way. I know that's way back in 2016, but I think you could probably find something better. But I can't beat you up for picking that because it looks, it looks okay. But you might have some spread issues or something. BCO. Yeah, this is kind of interesting. My only problem is that you're, you just have this one day of breakout, I'd much prefer if a stock had several days of breakout. Let's see if we can. I prefer a stock if it looked like this, like if it broke out, let's say it's in a range, let's say it breaks out and then maybe has that wide range bar. So you have this nice parabola higher as opposed to breaking out on one day and then already pulling back, okay? Now, this is for an established stock. IPOs can sometimes do this. I call it a flagpole. But in a case like, like this would establish an established issue, he tried to say, I'd much rather see several days of acceleration higher followed by a wide range bar instead of just a wide range bar in and of itself okay so i would pass based on that feel good on at 120. well here's the thing uh i did a i was loading some classic weekend charts last week or early this week in fact and i have one that i called options that never expire and if you knew a stock would never go bankrupt, then you could certainly buy it way down here at a buck a share. The problem is stocks do go bankrupt, okay? And then some cases like this, they'll reverse split you to death. Tidewater, for instance, just did like a reverse split. Uh, you know, it looked, it looked pretty cheap down here, but then they do like a reverse split. They'll kill you in those reverse splits. So that's the only problem with that. BTU. BTU is an IPO, right? Um, I seem to remember this company from years ago, so I'm wondering why it's coming public again. So I wouldn't be as excited about this as a new issue. It's a complex world, right? Uh, but maybe if it goes on to make new highs. Now, it did, it did make its all-time high on the first day of trading. So wait to see if it could go on to make new all-time highs. Now, it's kind of a shortened version of a, of a back here when it triggered this bow tie. It's a bit of a shortened version of the Phoenix pattern I was talking about earlier. Now, this wouldn't be an ideal setup. I'd like to see this maybe six months back and then this three or four months in the making and then the bow tie. 
But I was watching it come off of lows, and I passed, but I thought it was kind of interesting coming off of lows and making this bow tie because, as I said earlier, sometimes they're priced too high and they die, but then they get their act together and then begin to take off again. But now I think I would wait for it to bang out new highs or at the least, it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but since you had such a big wide range bar higher, gap higher, maybe a little bit deeper pullback in here, then look to get long. But I think that the, the safest thing to do would be to just let it make new highs and then look to get on a pullbacks along the way. If this thing is going to go to $100 a share, then let it get through Let it get through the mid-30s, low to mid-30s, or at least 32, 33, 34, whatever. Just get above this high and then look to play pullbacks along the way. You're not going to give up that many points by waiting. Okay. All right, we've got a fairly quiet bunch today. Any more? Kayla? Yeah, this one I like, and it is on my watch list. Um, it can be a little thin. Uh, the range isn't incredible just yet, but it's it's adequate, I suppose. But, yeah, let's see what we got on this one. Uh, yeah, it's got some decent volume early on. Let's put it in the five-day moving average. So there's two ways to trade this one. You could trade it on a pullback. My only problem with trading on a pullback is – it didn't make that huge of a run for an IPO. You like to see something kind of exciting happen with an IPO, but I think the range is big enough to make a, a breakout pattern worth trading. So you would actually already be long. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. You'd actually already be long here with the buy at B. But if you were looking to trade Dave Landry's moving average breakout system, IPO special system, whatever we're calling it, then you'd have to have a little daylight, which you had here. You don't have now. And then the close would have to close above this close here. So let me give you the parameters on that. And we'll come back and keep an eye on this one in upcoming uh, webinars. Close is 2037. So it would have to close above 2037. And the low would have to be greater than the five-day moving average. But, yeah, that's worth watching. So high five, Howard. How's that? First high five of the day. And I'm sure there were some other high fives, but I just remembered that I should be giving out high fives. All right, let's take a look at this one. This one looks a little funky, came public. Let's see, one, two, three. It never did close above that one-week high. See how that can keep you out of trouble, folks? I don't know why I said folks some reason it irks me when speakers say, folks, folks. <laughs> uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So this is your five-day high. Now, remember, we're not buying when it pierces that five-day high. But if it closes above it with some caveats, we're, we'll consider it. But notice that it never did close above it, and then it imploded. What I would do in a situation like this is I would just wait for new highs, okay, because it's kind of – Sold off hard, took off again. Let it prove itself by making new highs. Again, like I said earlier, if it's going to go, it's going to be a 10 bagger or whatever, go to 150 bucks a share, you can give up a little bit early on in a process. You know, we're trend followers. Sometimes you have to wait for that trend. SQ. This one's okay. It has been catching my eye as of late. My, my big problem with it now, though, is that, and again, I'm not Mikey and hate everything, but. Notice that its last breakout was at 25, and notice that it's back below its last breakout or probing it. If you're long, stay long, by all means. It's kind of like Kemet, which we've been long forever. It's lost steam quite a bit here and here and here. I'm okay with a stock once I'm in it. In fact, I actually prefer them, as I've been preaching to my peeps in the service, to take off base, take off base, rinse, and repeat because – 
this type of move is sustainable longer term versus this type of parabolic move that we saw briefly back here. So, but when I'm going into a position, I look for, for perfection, acceleration of trend, persistency, and all these other things that I'm often talking about. Okay, uh, ZB is a 30 year, ZB, I usually look at TLT, TLT. Well, 30 year bond, bonds and other highly liquid markets are tough to trade because they're very efficient. And if you go to free reports on my website, I make you walk through the gift shop first. So you, gotta, you have to go to store and go to the bottom. And there's an article on trading efficient markets. It doesn't mean that I won't trade an efficient market. In fact, sometimes you'll get shorting opportunities in efficient stocks, such as a big cap stock, such as a Dow 30 type of stock. But more often than not, it's hard to trade an efficient market, especially something like bonds, which has a tremendous amount of volume. And this is a case of the net net change. So we go back four months in time, roughly, or three and a half, and you can see that it's hardly gone anywhere in four months' time. So I would leave it alone. Now, speaking of bonds, something I should have brought up earlier. It's good that bonds are kind of hanging in there. We had a bit of a sell-off recently, but now we're retracing. And as I often preach, it's a delta in bonds that shakes the market. Like back here, when they begin to implode, that means interest rates are going up. It's the delta, or better said, the change, I should say, that spooks the market, not the, necessarily, not the necessary um, interest rate in and of itself. MYL. That's what Mylan Labs. Is that a joke? <laughs> Seriously? Did I give you a high five earlier? I'm gonna take it away. Yeah, this is banging out new lows. This is not uh this is not here's an example of what not to do. So remember earlier when I said come to the weekend charts? <laughs> if you don't believe me about picking mediocre stocks, you better take that one back. So, so you, is that the one you were looking for, the 30-year the treasury? Because I don't have the ZB symbol in my system. Kim had steam both ways yesterday. Yeah, Kim, you know, I dropped an F-bomb on that one yesterday, and then I caught myself and said, why am I doing that? And, you know, as I often say, a lot of times I drop an F-bomb, go for a walk, and then by the end of the day I'm like, oh, well, it really wasn't that bad. Or sometimes I'll even go positive. But, yeah, Kim was all over the place. I and I, I found myself watching the screen. You got to be really cognizant of your emotions and what you're doing. This is a longer term holding. I shouldn't get excited about it, okay? But yeah, gap tire sold off hard, but then by the end of the day, it came back nicely. And see, now we're actually up today, knock on wood. So this is why you don't want to rush out and panic every time a stock goes against you once you're long. You want to in for a penny, in for a pound, stay the course. I got to put an order in one second. Okay. Oh, you're welcome, Soul. I hope I'm saying your name right. AVAV. -V -V. Uh, no, this is something that's, that's let's do a net net change. Uh, it's going down 3% in two months, or is that a month? One month. 3% in one month. So, yeah, that's something that you won't. And then notice what I said, accelerated higher, and now it's beginning to roll over. So I would leave that one alone. Sam wants to talk about ZG. Zygus, maybe? Is that what that is? Zillow. Um, no. Uh, notice you made a new high here way back in June. Usually after about somewhere between 8 to 10 days, sometimes 11 or 12, depending on if the momentum is just absolutely incredible. But usually after 8 to 10 days of a new high, I tend to pass on pullbacks. So it's too many days in the pullback. And also, once you have this many days, then you get to the net-net price change. And you can go back and say that, okay, well, wait a minute. It has made a lot of progress as of late since, what, June? Two months. Connect the dots. I know it had a zag higher, but or zig higher, however you want to call it, say it. 
but it just net net base is unchanged for a couple of months in here. So leave that one alone, Sam. Now, anybody new here, uh, don't be nervous. I'm not going to beat you up too bad, but people have been around for a while. If I recognize your name, I'm going to beat you up. It's the new, it's the new Dave, the new, the new uh, tough love, Dave. Well, this is an IPO. It's certainly doing fairly well. Let's put in a five-day moving average, take a look at it. And you would have triggered in along here on that, but it looks okay. Um, what I would do now, because it's established itself, is I would wait to see if it could break out the brand new highs and then pull back as long as it stays well above this base. So 20 and change and pull back staying above 18, then yes. But definitely make sure that's on your watch list. Thank you for addressing the situation in Nigeria. <laughs> what the fuck the situation in Nigeria? That scared the hell out of me too. He like screamed it out. I'm like, what? <laughs> JKS. Well, you know, that's a testament for don't confuse the issue with facts. That's why I bought the domain, don't confuse the issue with facts. Um, this one's kind of launching off, off of fairly high levels, and it's wide and loose longer term. I mean, it looks okay. It's coming off of multi-year lows. Let's zoom in a little bit. Um, it's kind of stuck in this little bit of a range now. Two things. One, if it made maybe a knockout move, but it's just so wide and loose longer term. I'd have a hard time getting excited about it. Ideally, I'd like to see it maybe break out the brand new highs, clear, make multi-year highs in here, a multi-multi-year highs, and then pull back. But, yeah, it's definitely trending. I mean, you could certainly do a lot worse. SVDG, nice momentum. Well, the problem is now you're, you have this one huge up day. It's not that huge. So, yeah, I hear you because you've got a longer term gradual uptrend and it's beginning to accelerate higher. But I need to see more than one day before getting excited about it. All right. Any more uh, any more stock picks? We have a little time today. HCC. Yeah, that looks good. And this is one that's on my watch list. Uh, you got a really nice persistent trend higher. I mean, high five as far as a good stock to put on your watch list. Make sure that's on your watch list. Obviously, it is for you, Donald. Um, we've got a lot of Dons here today. It's funny. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, so far, so good. A little bit on the thin side. Let's see what kind of volume we have normally in this thing. No, it's got okay volume. Just not much volume today. And again, I'm not looking for volume as a prediction of price. I'm looking volume, looking at volume for judging whether or not it's liquid enough to trade. You know, here's another case of don't buy them unless they go up. And you can see here's day two. There's your high. And then this is your first close above that closing high was right here. And let's throw the moving average in for S&Gs and see what happens. So this was almost a buy here. Nope, this wasn't a buy because it's touched. This would have been a buy right there on that day there, based on a five-day moving average breakout, Dave Landry thing. But, yeah, keep an eye on this one on a trend knockout. For those of you who aren't familiar with that, you could uh, search for TKO, my website, or search for trend knockout, or go to videos, and there's a – video on that. I'll show you in one second here. Um, but yeah, look for a TKO or a pullback on that, but definitely put that in your in your watch list for sure. And I'll, I'll pull up that in another window and I'll get that up for you in one second. HCC Mule. Yeah, that's one that took off and then imploded. 
So yeah, you certainly don't want to buy that. We're not going to bottom fish, okay? So this stock is spent. Now it did take off a little bit, but then it came right back in. So you might have gotten a partial profit out of a trade like this or trailed your stop higher, but obviously you would have gotten stopped out. It doesn't always work trading IPO breakouts. If it or anything else did, you would never see my fat ass again, okay? So we all have to grind it out. None of us had the holy grail. But yeah, I wouldn't bottom fish here. You got all this overhead resistance to deal with. In fact, I don't bottom fish at all. Um, if you go to videos on my website, which is on the home menu. And you scroll down. It's Dave Landers featured short live lessons, featured short live lessons and special market updates. Um, TKO is right here. So watch that video. And that's a good pattern to enter something that's that's uh, in a really solid, solid uptrend. Nine S&P groups don't look so good. XLF, XLK, rest of the bunch. Um, well, financials are so-so. They're right around these prior highs in here. I mean, they look okay longer term. If you were holding them longer term, you'd still be holding them. And then XLK. Yeah, XLK, not quite as good. I don't really pay too much attention to XLK because I could just look at the NASDAQ. But I hear you, though. It doesn't look that great because it's kind of stalling towards its old highs. Where's the ETS? Exchange short of funds. Common stocks, let's see. I forget where they keep them now. Here we go, right here. What's the other axis? Can't be that many of them, huh? XLK. Oh, that's quite a few, yeah. Too many to look at. Yeah, you got to look at everything. I encourage look. Just look at as many charts as possible. But I, I, you know, you're onto something there, Howard. That uh, let's take a look at the Morningstar Industry Groups real quick. Let's just look at the let's look at the major groups, okay? So obviously, aerospace looks pretty good. Boeing's leading the charge there. Automotive sideways, banking kind of sideways, but up around new highs. That's okay. Chemicals, same sort of, well, even a little bit better than banks. So far, so good there. Hardware is soft, is going sideways in spite of the help from Apple. So this is concerning. So look at everything. And if you don't have time to look at everything, look at these major mid groups. And if you don't have time to look at the major mid groups, look at the Russell. If you don't have time to look at a Russell, then subscribe to my trading service and I'll do all this for you. Conglomerates, you can see that looks like the mother of all short setups. Consum consumer durables, we're going to roll over. Non-durables, okay, but losing a little steam. Diversified services, okay. So you can see going through these, and we talked about some of these already. Not quite as exciting as Dow 2200, okay, other than a couple of them in here like insurance, and I'm trying to think of another one. Maybe health services. Well, health services is losing steam too. So yeah, you got to look at everything. XLU, XLI, XLU's utilities looks okay, but you can see it looks like they're stalling out towards their prior highs in here. So I wouldn't get too excited about that. XLI, um, you know, another sideways. Okay, that's a little sideways as you can see. XLE. That's in a downtrend. That's energies. Okay. XLB, which is okay, but you can see net net, it hasn't done anything in what, a couple of months? So yeah, look at everything, Howard. That's a good, that's a good, uh, 
good point. OSUR, nice uptrend. Yeah, this is another one of those one day though, one day wonder type of deals. I got kicked by the mule a couple of times before it imploded. <laughs> Very funny. Cliff wants to talk about ENZ. ENZ. Yeah, uh, did we talk about this one already? My only problem with this one is it's it's a lot of sideways action. I think we talked about that one earlier. So I'll wait for it to hit new highs before um, I recognize you as a new name in here, Cliff. So I don't want to beat you up too bad. But, yeah, wait for new highs. We talked about that one. Yeah, we talked about that one. All right, any more? While we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate all you guys and girls showing up. I'm humbled by your presence. Anything unanswered, daviddavelandry.com. And if it's an answer that requires a lot of thought, it'll become fodder for our next week's show. All right, going once, going twice. Well, thanks again, everyone. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And then uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.